Good evening and welcome to our Sunday evening service. It's good that you could join us this evening. Uh, it's good to come together. It's good to be able to, to worship the Lord, even though we're not in the, in the, in the church meeting house. Uh, we can still worship him together uh, in, in, this, uh, in this virtual way, if you like. Uh, if you're visiting with us, if you're not usually with us, you're very, very welcome. Uh, we trust that you are blessed. Uh, we trust that you know uh, God's goodness uh, through being able to worship him, uh, to focus on him, uh, to look to him in, in this time of worship together. It can be a challenge, I think, to, to worship uh, in our own living rooms, in our own homes. It can be hard to maintain our focus. Let's just take a moment to be still before the Lord, to still our hearts, uh, to focus on him, uh, to dedicate ourselves to, to worship him uh, in this hour ahead. Let's be still for a moment. Father, you are a God who deserves our worship. Help us, Lord, to focus our minds and our hearts on you uh, for this time of worship that we have this evening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The psalmist writes, Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my innermost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. We worship together as we sing, fill your hearts with joy and gladness. going to read God's word together uh, and our response of reading this evening is Psalm 144 uh, and as usual uh, I will read the uh, the plain typed print uh, the the odd verses and if I could ask you to repeat with me uh, the, the even number of verses in bold type print this is God's word praise be to the Lord my rock who trains my hands for war my fingers for battle he is my loving God and my fortress my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield in whom I take refuge, who subdues peoples under me. O Lord, what is man that you care for him, the son of man that you think of him? Man is like a breath, his days are like a fleeting shadow. Part your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so that they smoke. Send forth lightning and scatter the enemies. Shoot your arrows and rout them. Reach down your hand from on high. Deliver me and rescue me from the mighty waters, from the hands of foreigners, whose mouths are full of lies, whose right hands are deceitful. I will sing a, a new song to you, O God, on the ten-stringed lyre. I will make music to you. 
to the one who gives victory to kings, who delivers his servant David from the deadly sword. Deliver me and rescue me from the hands of foreigners whose mouths are full of lies, whose right hands are deceitful. Then our sons and their youth will be like well-nurtured plants, and our daughters will be like pillars carved to adorn a palace. Our barns will be filled with every kind of provision. Our sheep will increase by thousands, by tens of thousands in our fields. Our oxen will draw heavy loads. There will be no breaching of walls, no going into captivity, no cry of distress in our streets. Blessed are the people of whom this is true. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. Amen. We continue to worship as we sing together. Guide me, O thy great Redeemer. going to watch a video now and it's an open doors video uh, and this video is highlighting the, the struggle uh, that Christians have in Nigeria. Uh, they have both uh, COVID-19 uh, to struggle and deal with at the moment uh, as well as just um, suffering attacks from, from Muslim extremists as well. So let's watch this video now together. These are doubly difficult days for Christians in northern Nigeria, already persecuted and now at risk from the pandemic. As one pastor explained, we are facing two monumental killers, killer herdsmen and coronavirus. 
Firstly, defying the COVID-19 curfew, Fulani militants continued to target Christian-majority villages. Open Doors visited a group of believers in Hura, Plateau State, just after their hamlet had been attacked in mid-April. We were just sitting right here with our children. Then we heard gunshots. We took up all our children and ran to the bush. When we came to the river, we looked back and saw the houses ablaze. We were not able to take anything with us. All we have are the clothes on our bodies. We heard a gunshot, then we heard shouts. They were shouting, let's follow and kill them. Then they began to speak the Fulani language. Before long, the sound of gunshots was everywhere. Everyone was confused. We all ran for our lives. We were all running in different directions. This morning, we came back together to see what had been done. Nine people were left dead in Hura, but it was just one of numerous deadly attacks against believers in recent months. And on top of this, Believers also face discrimination when it comes to COVID-19 aid distribution. Sources report that, during the coronavirus lockdown, Muslim-dominated areas receive a greater proportion of the food. One pastor from northern Nigeria spoke to Open Doors on condition of anonymity. I'm not just saying this just because I feel so. I'm saying this because I've seen it. I was privileged to see some of the documents for the sharing, the amount of bag of rice sent to a local government that is more Muslim dominated and the amount of the bag of rice sent to a local government that is more Christian dominated. The, the local government that is more Muslim dominated gets to have more bags of rice, more cartons of noodles and more other things than the Christian dominated areas. The highest most people have gotten so far is about two sachets of noodles and um, like a bowl of rice, and then a cup of oil. That is what we've seen being shared in majorly Christian-dominated areas. And we've seen how these foods are being shared. And they, it's, it's mad. It's, it's rowdy. It, it's not done orderly. In some of the sharings, we've had Christians faint and collapse in the struggles of trying to get food for their family. It is not just a marginalization. This is a persecution for Christians. It is assumed that the Christians can take care of themselves, but this is not the truth. Majority of us who are even Christian, including myself speaking, had to help some other people, not because we have, but we had to share from the little that we have. And we're praying to God that anyone who hears this and listens to this could feel the pain in our hearts in my heart to be particular and pray with us and also do something about this. Thank you. Please pray for the Lord's comfort to all who have lost loved ones in recent extremist attacks. Pray that they would comprehend the depths of Christ's love, even in the midst of their sorrow. Pray for the Lord's provision for believers who've been displaced from their homes because of these attacks and for all those who are facing severe food shortages at this time. Pray that Open Doors training and socio-economic projects will strengthen the Nigerian church and help Christians to demonstrate love and grace to their neighbours, even in the midst of this crisis. We're going to read God's word again together. Uh, I'm, I'm continuing to look at Colossians now, morning and evening. So this is really the second in, installment of uh, of Colossians. Uh, I'm looking at verses 9 to 14, uh, but let's read from verse 3 just, just for a bit of context and also just to remind ourselves uh, of what we looked at last, uh, last Sunday morning. This is God's word. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven, and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. 
All over the world, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may, you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, been strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. We thank God for this, his word again to us this evening. We're going to pray for others now. We're going to really focus in on um, on persecuted Christians, persecuted believers around the world who, who are struggling both with um, with COVID-19 uh, and, and with the persecution that, that they suffer. Let us pray together. Father, we are aware that uh, in this part of the world where we are very blessed uh, and as far as we can come, we can worship you, uh, worship you freely, Lord, without, uh, without the fear of, um, of people knocking on our doors, of people ridiculing us, uh, of people um, threatening us, Lord. We are thankful for that, Lord. We are aware that many of our brothers and sisters suffer, Lord, for worshipping you. They live under a uh, daily threat, Lord, uh, the threat, Lord, of even losing their lives. Father, we... we I think of our brothers and sisters in Nigeria, especially, Lord, after watching uh, this video this evening. Although we pray, we pray, Lord, that you would be near to those who have suffered uh, attacks, Lord, uh, in these last weeks. Be near to them, we ask, Lord, that they would know your comfort, that they would know that you are God who, who protects, Lord. Uh, help them to know your security, Lord, that they would know the depths of Christ's love, uh, even in the midst of, of sorrow, um, even in the midst of uh, fear, uh, that they would know your love. Father, we pray for your provision for them, Lord. Those who have been displaced from their homes, especially. Uh, those who um, are living in, in fear, anxiety, Lord. For those who, who now have a shortage of food, Lord. Um, those who are struggling to make uh, a living, Lord, because of uh, the situation with COVID-19, Lord. We pray, Lord, that they would be assured uh, that you will meet their needs, Lord. We pray, Lord, for agencies who are seeking to, uh, to provide food and to provide shelter, Lord. We pray that these agencies would um, have ample resources, Lord, that people would give to them, that uh, you would be working through them, Lord, to, to help these people uh, in places like Nigeria, where, where Christians really need help. We pray, Lord, just for the church, uh, again, in countries like Nigeria, Lord. Uh, we pray that Christians, Lord, even though they are, uh, they are suffering at this time, that they would be a light to you, Lord, that their, their love would, would shine out from them, that their witness would, would show your love, Lord, to those around them, that they wouldn't um, just react, Lord, when, when they're persecuted, but they would show your love. Father, there are so many countries where, um, where people are struggling, especially Christians at this time. We think of countries like India, uh, countries like Somalia, Lord, uh, where there is great um, destitution, Lord, uh, because of COVID-19. And where Christians, Lord, are, are simply at the back of the queue when it comes to getting aid, Lord. We pray that you would protect and provide for your people at this time, that they would know your, uh, your goodness, uh, that they would know that you are a God who uh, who meets the needs of, of his people. And pray, Lord, for us as well, Lord, that we would be uh, able to to help and to give where we can, where there is a need, Lord, where we, where we become aware of, of need, Lord, uh, especially need amongst your people, Lord, that we would be willing uh, to give generously when we can, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue in worship as we sing together, Just As I Am.
I'd love you to have your Bibles open as we, as we come to think about this passage together. Colossians chapter 1, uh, looking at the passage from, from verse 9. And let's pray as we come to, uh, to reflect on this passage together. Father, we pray that you would speak tonight, that you would be glorified in our lives as a result of this passage, that you would challenge us, Lord, uh, that you would help us to listen to you, Lord. Help us to be asking how we can apply this uh, to our lives, uh, we pray, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you picture the scene? A duck leading her brood of ducklings, seven in all, four black ones, and three yellow ones. They were lively and squeaky, scuttling to and fro. For days they had swum around with their mother in the little pond. Now it was time for her to take them to the nearby lake. This meant danger. To get them there, they had to cross a main road uh, and make their way through a park where dogs, cats, larger birds, and several other predators would be watching. Fortunately, the local residents in the area were prepared for this. They knew this moment would come and they made sure that the traffic came to a stop to let this little procession pass through. They reached their destination safely. But those watching were left marvelling at the mother's apparent calm confidence as she led her little family through the potential hazards and on to the larger world where she would then bring them up into maturity. Paul, writing this letter in prison to this relatively new church in Colossae, Paul is desperately keen to see them mature and to see them develop in the faith. He can't be with them in person. He can't be there himself to guide them and to teach them. So he writes this letter to them. They were facing dangers and challenges and they needed guidance and wisdom. Paul is seeking to help them and give them the guidance and the wisdom that they need. There were those teaching in Colossae, teaching things that were not in accordance with the gospel. They were teaching uh, and seeking to add things to the gospel. Now Paul, with his mother duck instinct, is trying to lead them in the right way. That they would grow and mature in the faith and that they would avoid the dangers of the false teachers among them. Paul was keen to see them avoid the dangers that there were. So let's look at this short section together under the heading, Maturity in the Faith. Maturity in the Faith. Paul wants the Colossians to mature in Christ. He wants God to fill them, verse 9, with the knowledge of his will. He wants them, verse 10, to be growing in the knowledge of God. Of course, we see Paul in other places in his letters encourage Christian maturity. For example, in 1 Corinthians, Paul's, Paul writes, Brothers, do not, be think, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. We also see many other references throughout Scripture about striving to become mature in the faith. The first thing I would like you to notice in this passage is Paul's great desire to nurture the faith of the Colossians. He desired to see them grow. And to nurture simply means, when we're nurturing someone, it means to care for them, to protect them while they're growing. Even though Paul is far away from them, far away from them, uh, he's not able to visit them, but he can certainly write to them. And he can also pray for them. And he's really seeking to encourage them here, isn't he? He's seeking to encourage them through telling them that he is praying for them. And also exactly how he is praying for them. It would seem likely that Paul was praying for them very much with their situation in mind. Uh, and his prayer reflects, uh, reflects that, that he's praying with their situation in mind. He knew that there were those teaching things that were not God's will. Therefore, he prays, with, he prays for them that God would fill them with the knowledge of his will. Paul knows that the Christians, um, 
he knows what Christians believe about God and as well. He knows this dictates how they live out their faith. That's why in verse 10 he says, the reason they, and it's not just Paul praying for them, they, but it's Paul and his, and his friends. The reason they pray this is in order that the Colossians may live a life worthy of the Lord. A life worthy of the Lord. Belief dictates action. Beliefs dictate how we behave. Uh, if the Colossians were, were believing things that were wrong, it would lead to wrong actions. Uh, it would lead to wrong behaviour. It would also mean that they wouldn't be maturing in Christ. So Paul wants to instruct them in correct belief uh, and in the correct living out of that belief. He wants them to live in a way, verse 10, that pleases God in every way. He wants them to bear fruit. He wants them, verse 11, to be strengthened with all power. He wants them to uh, develop endurance and patience as well. In verse 28 of this chapter, we read, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Now Paul's desire is to nurture the faith of, of the Colossian Christians. Uh, and this, this uh, desire to nurture them, uh, it leads us to ask ourselves, I think, a couple of questions. We must surely ask ourselves, am I being nurtured in the faith? Am I being nurtured in the faith? We all need to grow in Christ. And we never get to that point where we can say, ah, now I am, I'm fully mature in Christ. I, I've arrived. I don't need to grow anymore. Christian maturity, it's an ongoing process. We are always maturing, or, or at least we should be. In this life, we never reach that point of being fully mature in Christ. We are on a continuum of ongoing maturing. Even those people we know who we look to as, as older and, and wiser Christians, we might call them mature Christians. They are still growing themselves. They're still maturing we need ongoing nurturing. Are we making a point of receiving the regular Bible teaching we need to grow? Are we reading and studying scripture for ourselves? While it's perhaps not practical at the moment, it is in normal circumstances very beneficial to meet with others in, in small groups, to study the Bible and, and to pray together. It's good to read Christian books. Are we nurturing our own Christian faith? And secondly, are we seeking to nurture the faith of others? Are we seeking to nurture the faith of others? As we mature ourselves in faith, there is an increasing onus, onus on us to nurture the faith of others, those less mature than ourselves. If we, if we were to set Paul's example as our standard, we, we might become overwhelmed but if you have been a believer for maybe five, maybe ten years, we surely need to be asking ourselves, how can we encourage and nurture younger, less mature Christians? That could be face to face. But we do have plenty of other ways to communicate as well. Plenty of other means by which we can uh, speak to one another. Other means that we can encourage uh, and nurture one another. I sometimes like to compare Christians to beautiful flowers. A flower needs watered. It needs light to grow. It needs daily care. It needs to be placed in the right place. It needs to have just the right amount of water. The first shoots appear above the soil uh, as it is nurtured. And it gradually grows. It gradually develops. Then the flower itself blooms in great beauty. Like a flower, we need nurture to grow. Uh, we need nurture to mature in the faith. Are we seeking to nurture our own faith and the faith of others? Now we see this in Paul, the desire to, to nurture faith. Paul and his friends prayed that God would, verse 9, fill them with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Keeping in mind that the Paul was addressing and praying uh, into a particular situation in Colossae. 
He therefore prayed and wrote, he wrote this way for a reason. The reason may have been, according to commentators, that the false teachers were offering a fuller Christian experience through their teaching. They may have been offer, offering a deeper insight or a deeper knowledge into the things of God. This may well have been the first seeds of what became known as Gnosticism. And this, this, this uh, stream of thought became widespread through the second century. Gnosticism offered a special and a deeper understanding of spiritual reality, shared only by those, if you like, in the in crowd, only for those who, who were uh, part of their sect, if you like. And praying that God would fill them with the knowledge of his will, Paul seems to be saying that these teachers cannot promise any kind of special knowledge to the believers in, in, in Colossae. Only God can impart the knowledge of his will. This is his work, it, it's God's work. This knowledge comes through sound teaching and it comes through the illumination of, of the Holy Spirit. And the Greek word here, fulfilled, suggests the idea of filling out to completeness. An understanding of the will of God is always connected with the need to live out his will in our lives. And for this, Christians need, last line of verse 9, all spiritual wisdom and understanding. This wisdom and understanding is from God and grows as our relationship with him deepens. It is not to be likened to human wisdom or our human understanding. And the Greek word here for understanding suggests a practical application of the wisdom given by God. A practical application of the wisdom given by God. As Christians, we want to be filled by God, not, with, with, not, not filled with the things of this world. In Colossae, the Christians were being drawn away by false teaching that added something to the gospel. And for us today, uh, the challenges, I think, are, are different. As Christians, we can simply be drawn into a world which is secular, which is godless, which gives little thought to God. We can be distracted by a busy lifestyle, a busy culture. We can be distracted by our screens. We can be drawn in by a media which seeks to dramatize and to promote fear. We can be sucked in by manipulation that seeks to massage our egos and sell us things that we don't really need at all. If we focus on the things of the world, then we will be filled with the things that are important to the world. If we focus on God alternatively, if we focus on God, then we will be increasingly filled with the things of God. Where do our minds predominantly rest? On the things of this world or on the things of God? As we ask and desire to know the will of God, we must strive to spend time dwelling on the things of God and on developing our relationship with him. We desire for God to fill us with the knowledge of his will. And this, is, this is his work. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. But we, we must set our minds on him and on, on, on his things. God wants us to mature in the faith. And we see this reflected in, in, in Paul's uh, desire to nurture the faith of the Colossians. He wants them to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. He prays this because it is God's work. It is God's work to fill us uh, with this knowledge. And last week we learned about the evidence of the gospel. In verse 6 uh, we read that all over the world the gospel is bearing fruit and growing. And again, Paul here in verse 10 speaks of the fruit. He speaks of fruit. Verse 10 reads, and we pray, we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every good way, bearing fruit in every good work. For Paul, it is really important that faith translates into action. That it does not remain simply a disconnected belief in Christ, but that, that it is translated into action, that it becomes deeds. When Paul speaks of a life worthy of the Lord, 
He is speaking of the outworking of our faith in our decisions, in our employment, in our day-to-day actions, in the way we choose to spend our time, in how we treat other people. Let's just pause to think about, about the phrase, bearing fruit in every good work. Uh, bearing fruit in every good work. Now, there are two ways that we could understand this phrase. Firstly, we could understand it to mean that good works are the fruit that Paul is talking about. Uh, that would make a lot of sense in many ways. But the other way to read this is that the good works, the good works um, lead on um, to the bearing of the fruit. They lead on from this bearing, um, they lead on from the from the good works. Um, that is not the good works here themselves that are the fruit, but the good works lead on to the bearing of fruit. The good works lead on to the bearing of fruit. If this is the case, what might the fruit itself be? Well, it could be the fruits of Christ-like character beginning to grow in the lives of those who have turned to Christ, partly as a result of the good works done by believers. They have seen or have been recipients of these good works and they have been drawn to God as a result. Perhaps this is the fruit. Or the fruit could be the fruit in the lives of the Christians themselves who are carrying out these good works. When we do good works for God, he blesses that. And we grow and we mature as a result of the good works that we do. The fruit leads on from from the good works. We know, uh, I would say through experience, that when we put ourselves in situations where we do good works for God, where we do things for him that we haven't done before, things perhaps like being on a mission team or or maybe even leading a Bible study group or maybe simply just going out of our way to to, to help someone, taking time uh, to help someone. When we do things for God, we grow as a result. We grow as a result. We see fruit in our own lives and potentially in the lives of those that we are working with. Faith produces fruit. Faith leads to works. uh, And we could regard those good works as the fruit. But also the fruit could be regarded as growth that comes through the good works, through doing the good works. In the Psalms we read, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. As Christians, we mature and bear fruit through seeking to do good works. So we have talked about faith. We've talked about being filled with the knowledge of the will of God. We've talked about fruit. Finally, we want to talk about focus. Focus. Paul wants the Colossians to maintain the focus. To maintain the focus. In verses 12 to 14, Paul reminds the Colossians of this focus. This focus is the gospel. He wants them to mature But to do this, they must maintain and be reminded of their focus. It is God the Father who has qualified them to share the inheritance. They haven't had to do a qualifying exam to get into the kingdom. They haven't had to pass an entrance test. God has qualified them. And God has qualified us through the work of the cross to share in this inheritance. We have full standing as enlightened enlightened members of God's chosen people. The false teachers in Colossae seem to be teaching that you you needed something more to be fully fully fledged members of, of the kingdom. Paul is saying, no, no, not at all. You already have full membership. They weren't junior members. They weren't, weren't probationary members. They were full members of the kingdom of light. They didn't need anything further to bring them from this dominion of darkness into the dominion of light. God had already rescued them. He had already brought them into this kingdom, into the kingdom of his beloved son. It is only through Jesus that we have redemption. Redemption could be defined as 
the release from bondage with outside help. We can't redeem ourselves. In the Old Testament, God redeemed Israel from slavery in Egypt. They couldn't free themselves. Only God could. Also in the Old Testament, you have the concept of a kinsman redeemer, who was a close male relative, obliged under the law to assist relatives in distress. He would buy back their property, or perhaps even buy them back out of slavery. He provided the help that was needed. They couldn't help themselves. They needed the help of a kinsman redeemer. But for us, what is the help that we need from God? Paul goes on to define that, verse 14, the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of, forgiveness of sins. We need rescued because of our sin. We need outside help to deal with this. We can't deal with it ourselves. We can't forgive or wash away our own sin. God is the only one who can deal with our sin. And the way he does that is through the cross. In chapter 2, verse 14 of Colossians, Paul writes, He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to a cross. Through our sin being nailed to a cross, we are forgiven. Christ took that sin upon himself. He paid the just price. Because he did that, we now know redemption. We couldn't do this ourselves. We couldn't do this ourselves. We have been rescued. We have been set free. As Christians, this fact is the centre of our faith. It is our focus. We have great blessing, uh, this great blessing of maturing in the faith. But we must strive to mature. But never leave the cross behind. It remains our focus. The only reason that we can mature in, in Christ is because we have access to the kingdom through Christ. At the Last Supper, Jesus was giving the disciples a, a kind of ritual to ensure that, his, uh, to ensure that they, they remembered him. That they remembered his death, which was for them. That they might know this redemption. That they might know the forgiveness of sins. As we move forward in, in Christian maturity, we must never lose our focus, which is Christ crucified. It is important to Paul that his readers are striving to become mature followers of Jesus. He is seeking to nurture their faith, that they be filled with the knowledge of God's will. He wants to see their faith bear fruit as they do good works. But he also wants them to maintain their focus. He wants them to maintain their focus, which is the gospel message of, of redemption, the forgiveness of sins through, through the work of the cross. Let's take a moment to be still, simply just to reflect on God's word this evening. Let's be still. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word to us. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for what we have to learn from it this evening, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would imprint your word upon our minds, Lord. Uh, challenge us, Lord, as to what exactly you want us to, to apply to our lives uh, through your word this evening. Lord, we thank you that you desire for us to mature in you, to grow in you, uh, to be filled with the knowledge of your will. Lord, we pray that you would um, help us to know what your will is in our day-to-day -day life, Lord. Father, we pray that uh, our lives would also bear fruit, that our lives would bear fruit, Lord, that uh, we would see uh, the fruits of the Holy Spirit in our life, Lord, the, the qualities of love, um, the qualities of joy, patience, Lord, um, growing and becoming greater and greater in our lives. Lord, help us to maintain our focus. 
Help us to have the cross uh, central in our minds that our focus would always be Christ crucified for us. Help us to pass this on to others as well, Lord. We pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We close our service by singing together, I offer up my life. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen.